So as promised last month, we're going to go and delve into uh, average rates specifically a little bit more uh, this month and talk about some of the actions and strategies that, uh, that you can apply in your firm to drive average rate. So let's get underway. Okay, so just a just a little note here. Uh, stay tuned until the end. Um, right at the end of the uh, webinar, we will have a uh, a little uh, assessment for you to be able to participate in. That will um, enable us to give you uh, an, a quick overview of of where you are in relation to your actions that you need to be implementing for your average rate. And we'll run through all that right at the very end. There'll be a couple of things that you'll be able to participate in live uh, at the end of the webinar. And um, we'll then be able to send you through some specific information in relation to your firm. So just stay tuned right till the end. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the two key components of financial management for a law firm are to focus on profit and cash flow, as is as is the case with any business. Now, when we look at profit, what you need to actively manage is the relationship between your revenue that you generate, so your professional fees and your direct labour costs. So that's the labour costs that you that you uh, incur to generate that revenue. And we're talking there about your you know, yourselves as principals, or yourselves as solicitors. Uh, legal support people and so on. And so that ratio and that relationship between those two two, uh, two items is what I see in most firms, the, the biggest reason for challenges around cash flow. And from a cash flow point of view, what you need to be focusing on is shortening that period of time between when a costs agreement is signed and when the final cash is collected. I'm not going to be spending any time today on the cash flow side of things, but uh, in, in in summary, uh, basically, uh, the, the quicker you get the work done, the more regularly you bill it, generally, the shorter the period of time it takes for cash to come into the, the bank and your cash will improve. Okay, so let's take a, take a bit of a deeper dive into um, what it uh, what drives that that revenue in your in your business? And and whenever you look at whenever you look at the profitability of, of your firm, you've got to have a look at the relationship between the between the revenues that you generate and the costs that you incur to generate that. So if you think of an example like say a, a pair of 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 glasses. So if, for any of those of you who are who are wearing glasses today, I'm wearing a pair. There is a whole range of different input costs that go into those glasses. All the different things that you've got to spend spend the the money on to be able to make them. So glass, for example. So uh, you know you've got to be able to you've got to get your lenses in those glasses. Uh, you've got people time that go into uh, the manufacturing process. Uh, you've got um, that's not a Coke bottle, so it's not for Coke bottle glasses. It's more about plastic. So you've got plastic generally that would go into it. Uh, you've got machine hours, and you've also got other other parts and components. So all of these different inputs go into manufacturing that uh, those pair of glasses. And then what the then based on that manufacturing cost then you go and sell those glasses at a certain price to make what's called a gross profit on it. So for a law firm, it's a little bit different. There is still, it's still critical for managing and understanding what all those different input costs are, but we actually can do that a little bit more directly and a little bit more simply because, because for our output of revenue, our, our main input cost and really our only input cost is the cost of our labour, and so the, that's the cost of our of our professional and non-professional uh, uh, labour. So I'm not talking there about your labour cost for uh, your, your, a practice manager or a labour cost for a receptionist. This is a labour cost that you incur in your business for 
for those people whose primary function it is to work on client matters. So if you think about it, you're, you're spending all this money for these people to work on client matters, and then you look at, well, that's the cost that, that we've got to generate our revenue. How much revenue do we need to make? So what we've got to really focus in on, and I'm when I say focus in on, I don't mean focus in on once a year. I mean focus in on quarterly, monthly, uh, weekly, daily. We've got to really focus in on strategies in the business to maximise the uh, the revenue that is output from those input costs of direct labour. So. The first thing to do is really understand what you make per hour. And this is probably one of the biggest eye openers that I see in, in law firms, particularly, particularly when it comes to engaging with uh, your professional fee earners and fee earners generally around what, what is made per hour. And look, there are, there, there are basically three different numbers uh, that, uh, that people might, might put up. First of all, they, they, they refer to their charge rate. So if you've got a charge rate, what is, you know, I ask the question, what do you make an hour? And, and the usual reply is, oh, it's you know, $350 an hour, it's $450 an hour, I make $500 an hour. My answer to them is, do you really? Because in, 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 in the psyche of fee earners, that's the number that they know. That's the piece that they sort of think uh, is what they're making. You know, that's what we say to clients that, you know, we're charging you at a rate per hour. So it's a natural extension for them, even though it's not right, it's a natural, a natural extension to for them to think that, that that's what they make per hour. Then what you've got, you've got your build rate. So you've got you've got a rate that that for those hours worked on a on a matter that then is billed. So that might not be the same as a charge rate because you might um, you might have a, a $400 an hour um, charge rate, but you write off 10% of that so that all you're billing is $360 an hour. So the build rate is actually different to the charge rate because the build rate is represented by the average rate per hour spent on a matter that you have then um, that you've then gone and built. Now, fixed rates work pretty much the same. So for any of any of you out there who've got fixed rate services, and usually the biggest challenge that I see in firms around fixed rate services are on their simple wills and on their on their conveyancing, where their 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 build rate is actually a lot lower because of the of the time that it takes to do that work compared to the fee that they charge. So if you've got Let's say, for example, you've got a matter that takes 10 hours at $400. Um, an hour is the charge rate, but you build, only build 3,600 of it. You've got $360 an hour in terms of your build rate versus a charge rate of 400. But if that was a, a fixed price uh, matter that took 10 hours, but all you can bill is $1,500 an hour, then your build rate's only 150. So they're very different. And then the third rate, and and the most important rate, the one that actually drives performance, and the one that that everybody needs to understand, is the average rate. An average rate is critical to understand because it is the it 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 it, it is determined by looking at that relationship between your revenue and the actual hours that are, are paid. So let me show you some some calculations around that, just to just to give you a bit more of a detailed picture of what that looks like. So first first thing we need to have a look at is is how many hours are, are people at work. So so we start with you know we've got 38 hours in a week and there's 52 weeks in a year. So 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 with those. So with those paid hours, people are paid 7.6 hours a day. Oop. Yeah, one, sorry, 1976, which will, what's going on here? Yeah, oh, sorry, 52 weeks. They're paid for 52 weeks in the year. Sorry about that. Um, what comes out of that is, so even though people aren't working, 
and they're taking leave, you still pay them for a full-time equivalent 52, 52 weeks. What comes out of there is annual leave of four weeks generally, um, another two weeks for public holidays and then another two weeks for, for personal leave. So what that produces, it means that there's 44 weeks that you're expecting people to actually be there. And the difference between your, your available hours, so the hours that they're expected to be at work, not the hours that they're actually working, and the hours that you actually pay them, there's already approximately a 300 uh, hour difference. Okay, so then if we've, we've got 1,672 hours there that people are, are actually at work, and we're expecting them to bill out uh, and to, well, to bill out generally, but also to do work on client matters of 5.5 hours a day. So what that means is out of that 1,672 hours, there's only 1,210 hours that you're actually expecting them to, to charge, in, charge into WIP. And let's say their charge rate was $420 an hour. So that gives us our first, first number. It gives us our charge rate, our per billable hour. Here is an expectation of it being $420 an hour. And I, I make this comment here around capacity and I'll come back that, to that a little bit uh, in, in, in a little bit. Um, but needless to say, that's what the ex first, first line of expectation is around what people make an hour. But then the reality kicks in. How many hours are we actually charging into WIP? And let's say that instead of doing five and a half, people are only doing four hours a day. So what that then produces is revenue that's charged into WIP of three six, sorry, time that's charged into WIP of 369, but we then go and write 10% of that off. So that what ends up being billed is only 332,000. We're actually expecting them that they should be building 508,000, um, but they're only putting in 369,000 into it, but they're not even billing all of that. It's coming in at 332. So when we have a look at that in terms of those different rates, and we see what those rates are here, you've got your average rate there sitting at 420 being your rate per hour. You then have a different rate of 378 per hour, which is the number of hours uh, that have that have been charged into WIP divided by uh, divided into the, the the actual amount billed, which gives you 378. But the real average rate is only $168 an hour. So with that being $168 an hour, that takes into account all of the leave that they are paid, all of the time that they are paid, whether or not they're working on a client file, or even if they are, it 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 it, it includes all of that time as well as the time that they are spending working on clients. So this formula is calculated by looking at the amount of the revenue and dividing it by and dividing it by the number of paid hours, 1,976. So if you've got a part-time person and they work um, four days a week instead of five, then their baseline paid hours is then 80% of 1,976. But you can see this massive difference and that's one of the key things that you need to get your team educated on. They need to understand that, hey, that's what your charge rate is, but that's not what we make per hour. What we make per hour is something far, far less than that. OK, so that's that's those three numbers. So just park that in the back of your mind now and um, and uh, and we'll come back to that table again shortly. OK, so to measure profit, this is what we've got to start with in the firm. So, so the first thing is we start with average rate. OK, and when we look at average rate, we also need to look at the what I call the efficiency factor. And and explain the efficiency factor shortly, but the efficiency yeah, in a bit more detail, but the efficiency factor is generally it's an it's an understanding of what your actual revenue is that you're generating compared to what you what you should be generating. And that tells you how efficiently those resources that you're employing are being being utilized. So from an average rate perspective, the, the average rate formula is professional fees billed divided by direct labor hours paid. So when I talk about direct labor hours, it's for 
Um, that's for uh, principals, even if they're not paid in uh, wages, just received dividends or drawings, then it's still those number of hours that you're, that you're working because uh, that, that impacts on the, on the bills that are generated. For solicitors, all of your legal support people. So what it measures, it measures the actual amount of revenue earned for every single hour of direct labour cost paid to earn that revenue, whether at work, on leave or billed to a client. And this is your true measure of what your return is that you are getting on every hour that you need to pay somebody to employ them, whether they're there working or not. So what we want to see over time is we want to see our average rate uh, increasing, which means we're getting a, a better return out of that labour cost employed. Go back to your glasses. If we can make those glasses more efficiently, um, then we get a then we get more profit in them. Or if we do we need to get our prices up to to sell them for a higher price so that we can make more profit? Or is it a mixture of both? Now efficiency factor is a is a percentage, and it's. It's basically determined by your professional fees bill divided by your capacity revenue. So what it what it does it it, it measures it measures your efficiency of your labour to maximise your revenue. Now, professional fees bill very easily understood. That's just what we bill out to clients. But capacity revenue. Let me sort of. Let me run through that and give you a bit of an overview and we'll go back and do some more calculations. Capacity revenue is the revenue that you should expect, you, you, you do expect a person to generate. So in most firms, revenue is generated at a, at a, at a, at a rate per hour on, on work done for clients. So, so your capacity revenue is the number of hours you expect somebody to be working on your uh, on client matters multiplied by their their charge rate. Now you might have a you might have somebody who's got a different charge rate, or for one service they or one 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 type of work they do uh, they have one rate and another type of work they do they have another rate. It's the blended rate in in that case based on the percentage. But for most firms they have a singular rate. Uh, charge rate that they apply for uh, their employees per employee, different per employee. So, so that's what your capacity is. It's how many hours you're expecting out of those available hours for somebody to do work and and uh, add that into WIP and then ultimately bill. So, so by measuring the difference between your capacity revenue and your professional fees billed, tells you that 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 we're either efficient or not in terms of our utilization of that resource to produce the maximum amount of revenue possible. And what it comes down to is a whole bunch of systems and processes that you really need to be focusing in on that make the biggest difference in your your business. So when when we when we look at that average rate and we look at how you derive and generate your revenue, so again if you're Professional fees bill is calculated at all of the hours that have been spent on uh, that client matter multiplied by the relevant charge rates and then multiplied by the relevant recovery rate being your client what time is being written off. So if you've got a if you've got a charge if you've got a thousand dollars in WIP and you and you bill out nine hundred then you've got a 10% write-off, so your recovery rate's 90%. So your professional fees has always come down to those those dollars that are that are billed. So so what you've got to look at is what are those activities that drive that uh, that that those professional fees being billed, and what are the activities that you then need to monitor, focus, and change. So so when it comes to calculating average rate, there are really two other numbers that you can simply measure and they are your productivity which is your charged hours divided by your available hours now charged hours basically meaning how many hours on matters have we entered into our timesheets i prefer to call them charged hours and not billable hours because there's a there's a key uh, contextual difference um, 
that that we need to shift in people's psyche. And that is people making the decision at the point in time of them doing their timesheets as to whether or not a client should be charged with it or build it or not. So people often think, well, I'm not going to charge the client for that. I don't think they should. I've taken too long or, for, or it's a bit of research or I should have known that or whatever. But they make that decision to to uh, not include it in WIP, which is the same as making the decision not to bill it. I often say that most bad debts are written off in a firm at the time of doing timesheets because they don't even get to, to the opportunity to, to bill it to a client. So that's the first KPI that, that we, we've got to get a good focus on is, is their productivity. Second thing is the write-off, and it's the, the, the amount of WIP that's written off divided by the total amount of WIP on the matter. So again, if you've got $1,000 worth of WIP on the matter and you only bill $900, uh, $1,000 only bill $900, then you've written off $100, which is a 10% write-off. So if we can get our productivity, if we just go back here and we think about the, the efficiency factor here, if our capacity here is based on five and a half hours a day, say in that example that I, that I, I threw up on the screen before, at a charge rate, if we can get our productivity percentage being the number of hours that are actually charged into uh, on, on matters on our timesheets for the days that we are actually there at work, so charged hours divided by available hours, at that rate, we're going to we're going to at least have a starting point of getting more time into WIP. Now I know you would have been bashing feels like bashing your head up against a brick wall often about uh, with employees talking about just end of the time, end of the time, end of the time. Um, bit of a broken record, you know, Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But that is the key to improve it. We what are the strategies and actions we need to do to get that level of, of time entry, that level of whip? into it. Too many firms focused on the on the other outputs. The key to driving improved revenue is to focus on the core input of WIP. It's work in progress management. Most people focus on billings and or cash received. Both of those those items only occur after WIP is entered. So you've got to build those strategies. So again, if we're looking here at these these two other KPIs, if we can get more productivity up, we can get more time entered into WIP, we're going to have the larger amount of WIP entered, gives us a greater chance of achieving our, our, our WIP, uh, our billings targets. Then from our write-off, whatever's going into WIP, we want to make sure all of that gets billed because anything we write off just comes straight out of our revenue and reduces our, our bottom line. So, so they're the two components of, of billings. Now, there's one thing that actually drives all of this um, really, you know, it's the key driver, and that's that's your actual production output. So call it velocity days. So the speed at which a matter is finished. So when, when work is done and it's finished and it's completed and it's billed quickly, then clients pay. You've got a much better chance of, of billing all of your whip and collecting it. Okay, so let's go and run through a couple of other little um, uh, scenarios here. Um, on our on our numbers calculations, so so I'm just going to put in here a a, um, a salary of 125,000. So if we look at this particular, if we look at this, well, so shouldn't be a minus. That should just be a normal. So if we if we if we look at this particular uh, solicitor, you know they've they've billed out 332,000. It costs them 125 the firm 125. So they make a gross profit out of that. 207. Out of that, they've got to go and pay, um, you know, admin wages. Um, often I see there's, there, because there's poor billing and timesheet entry and poor systems around the legal support people, that they also need to um, pay legal support costs out of that gross profit. Other overheads, rent and, and phones and internet and all of those things all come out of the gross profit. So, so it's a really important piece to understand because what's happening here in this firm is when you've got these, where you've got 
in this review, an efficiency factor of 65% for this person, meaning that their expected capacity was 508, but they're only doing billing of 332, means that they're only running at 65% of their expected budget, if you like, if you know what's expected of them. So there's a big gap there for improvement. They're paying $63 an hour um, for that particular um for that particular solicitor because they've got to pay uh, still pay 1976 hours which means the gross profit that they're making per hour is only $105 and that's the number that they've got to then pay out all the other wages um if if you've got legal support people that aren't having their own budgets and driving driving up revenue all of the other overheads and so on before you even get to net profit before tax before all of those things so let's look at the key influences that that these drivers have. So let's say let's say we 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 wanted to work out how we're going to because what we want to do is we want to increase our average rate. And if we increase if we can increase our average rate based on the same number of hours that are expected to be be billed, we're going to naturally increase our efficiency factor. So let's say the first thing we do is we you know, put timesheets up by ten dollars. So a, a ten dollar change in in our timesheet only in uh, in our charge rate only increases our uh, capacity revenue by twelve thousand dollars because we're already expecting five and a half hours. But let's say we get some really good strategies in place um, around um, which I'll talk about shortly around you know getting people to actually put all the time down into WIP for the work that they're doing. And we could get that up just by another half an hour a day. So for an extra 30 minutes for this particular person, we've we've automatically got an extra $56,000 worth of time being entered into WIP. And then we improved some efficiencies, we improved some billing processes, and we got the write-off down to 5%. So we've only got a 5% differential there in this work. But the difference that it makes in that gross profit is $71,000 because our labour cost is the same. So have a look at the impact that that has on our, um, on our, on our, on our numbers. Our, our target charge rate is only up by $10, but our charge rate for billable hours has gone from 378 to 409 because we are we are bill we're putting more in time in but we're also recovering more of it which drives our average rate up to $205 an hour our efficiency factor is at about 78% once once efficiency factors start getting up around the 90% generally generally you'll find that you've got an extremely efficient business uh, because it's very rare that everybody continues to hit their actual expected budgeted hours. So, so, so what that does, it has the impact here of increasing our gross profit per hour from 105 up to 141. So really good positive positive outcomes there, just by focusing on those key strategies. Simple, simple increase in charge rate, strategy to get uh, more time ended into WIP and then a strategy for reducing the write-offs. And that happens at the point in time of billing. Naturally, those numbers then flow through to better revenue. Just to expand that out a little bit further, so I've, I've taken taken those numbers and, and put them out here into a, into a bit more of a, 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 a bigger firm sort of based uh, calculator, uh, just to show you how how those average rates, small changes to those average rates can have significant impacts. So this is just on that baseline there of that solicitor. So two of those solicitors, but same numbers. So let's say, let's say in this firm, yeah, we've got seven support people. Um, that's the amount of dollars that they that their target to put into it. So that's our capacity revenue. But let's say their average productivity, instead of it being 39%, Across the board, we got that to 47%. So what that means is that on average there for these for this firm, less than 47%, less than 50%, so at 47% of the hours that people are available to work, they're the only amounts that are getting put into timesheets. So it's still very, very low. So what that gives us, it gives us an increase in our billable hours. So it means we've got more hours being billed into WIP. Let's say we increase our our, our charge rates um, um, and and recover. Most firms 
Most firms charge rates are too low. Um, charge rates are a bigger issue for you than it is to your clients. Um, I see this time and time again. But what that does by just focusing on those small changes in those couple of items produces a difference there of now $2.42 million that's actually been added into WIP. What we've then got is we've then got uh, a write-off. And let's say instead of it being at, at uh, 7%, we manage that right off, just get it down to, to six. So a tiny improvement there gives us you know, an extra 35 minutes a day into WIP um, at a higher charge rate, at a small improvement in recovery, drops extra revenue of $464,000 into this firm's um, revenue line and what that then produces is um, an improved average charge rate, an average rate of $34 an hour. So it has, a, it has a compounding effect when you focus on this across all the different aspects of your, of your business. So singularly you can see an impact, but when you look at it across all of your business, um, the, the, the small changes have a profound impact. Um, and I'll uh, and 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 our next webinar next month when we go through the uh, the key cash flow driver, um, then uh, I'll also show you the impact that that has that extra profit has, and the impact of improving your your lockup percentage has on your cash flow. So, how do we improve average rate? There's all the theory. Let's get down into how you do it. So, the first thing that the first strategic change. There are three things that you've got to remember. Um, you've got to focus on the things that you can 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 control. You've got to focus on the on doing something differently, and you've got to focus on the majority, not the minority. So let me explain that a bit a bit more. So the first thing is the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept what I can't control, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Too many times, what we're doing is we're trying to focus on the things that we can't control in a business. So they're those systems, processes, outcomes that we've got no real control over. And the more energy we expend on that, it's it's it, it's useless, it's futile. So what we've got to do is we've got to stop and think about Einstein's definition of insanity. What do we need to do differently to get a different result? So what we can do differently is we can focus on the things that we can control, build systems and processes around those things that we can control, and then implement them. But when we're implementing those new systems and, and, and we're working out what those systems are that we need to implement, we need to focus on the majority, not the minority, because with most systems that exist in businesses, they exist to stop the squeaky wheel. They, 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 they exist to stop the, the small number of occurrences that make the noise. You know, if I, one question I always ask firms is that uh, when, they, when they say, yeah, you know, clients are clients are really, um, really price sensitive. And I say, no, they're not, you are. And they'll say, well, that's not right. And I'll go, well, yes, it is. So how many invoices do you issue a month? Oh, we issue 500 invoices a month, 300. doesn't really matter what the number. And how many fee inquiries do you get? Oh, you know, only a handful. Oh, well, that's telling me you actually don't have clients that are sensitive to, to price because if you focus on the majority, majority are, are happy to pay. Now, no one really likes paying legal fees, but hey, that's just how it is. That's business. That's what they need. That's what they need done. So they need to pay. So again, if we focus on those three things, what can we control, do something different and focus on the majority, then you're going to get a better outcome. So, so if we think about how an outcome is, is achieved, an outcome is achieved by a series of behaviours, a series of decisions that people are made within their business to determine what they're going to do. And those series of behaviours, those series of you know, individual decisions that are made are generally based on the structure. Someone could have, you know, the tighter structure, but someone just goes, I'm not doing it. You know, again, that might just be an exception. That might be a minority. But the vast majority of people, of your employees, will do what's expected of them. Most of them just don't know what's expected of them, and that's the first challenge that you've got. So if you want to change your outcome, what you've got to do is change your behaviour, and to change your behaviour, you've got to have a different structure. 
And so your structure of those key actions that you implement or how you structurally change things to be able to get the right behaviours in the business to produce the outcome. And so just popping back here, if we want to if we want to improve our average rate, one is to let's get our, mat, our work done more efficiently, faster, turned around. Sometimes that's way out of our control. But what we can control is improvement of productivity. Let's get more hours into WIP. And then when so that's that's at your timesheet entry. And then how we can also improve our average rate is we can bill more that goes into WIP. So if we're getting more into WIP and then what's in there billing more of it, we're going to get an increase in our revenue, just like I showed you in the numbers. So that's the key. Change the structure, get a different behaviour, produce a different outcome. OK, first and foremost, you need to remove discretion. Discretion is a profit killer. Discretion is the application of the rules by somebody how they see fit. I'll make my own decision around how I do it. Um, if you want to get predictable revenue, predictable profits, predictable cash flow, you need to remove discretion because time entry and billing is a financial function. And you need to have that structured in a way that maximises the opportunity for time to be entered and time to be billed. So you've got to remove discretion around these key areas. First of all, fee earner engagement. It's really critical to make sure that that, that is standard and mandatory. This is how we engage our employees. So fee earners need to know what's expected of them. Um, in Gallup's Q12, not the Gallup poll that we see in um, uh, in politics, but it's an international company that focuses on employee engagement. Um, that 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 survey that survey firms and businesses all over the world. Um, the number one the number one uh, criteria for for employee engagement is I know what's expected of me. Most people when they know what's expected of them, they go and do it. That's what the majority does. But if you don't know what's expected of them, they don't know what's expected. They, they, they don't know what they've got to achieve or strive to. What we say to them is, you need to do $40,000 of billings a month, right? So that's a massive number. Well, no, what, what's expected of you is you just do five and a half hours of work. Now, we've got plenty of work for you, so just put it all down in your timesheet. So that's the that's the first thing. Get your employees engaged around what's expected of them. You're expected to do this work. You're expected to delegate that work to your this work to your legal support person. You're expected to do your timesheet every day. You're expected to hit your five and a half hours or five hours or whatever your whatever your number is. But engage them around that and effectively get them to sign off. So once they know, then you've got a chance of them hitting it. The next thing is client engagement. Client engagement is the key. Client engagement is your sales is your sales order or purchase order. Sales order from your point of view, purchase order from their point of view. So it's the point where they say, yeah, we're going to do the work. So get your get your estimates in there, get your quotes in there. Make sure that they are conducive to being able to generate the right profit that you make out of that work. But more importantly, advise the client that if it's going to go out of scope or if it's going to go over over our estimate, then we're going to re-engage you. So client engagement is not just about how you engage them at the front end, it's how you keep them engaged throughout the entire engagement. Workflow management is the key. Workflow management is the is is one of is one of the main drivers. What happens with most uh, law firms is the work that is required to be done by a solicitor is absolutely left up to them to uh, work out what they're going to be doing and, and when. Now, some of that is driven by um, by specific court-based timeframes or, or, or other specific uh, due dates and, and, and milestones that have got to be achieved. But generally, I see in firms, it's turn up for the week and what's on my matters list, here's these matters that I've got to do, I've got a couple of bring-ups that will come up on my system that will remind me to do this and this. But generally, I've got to work out what I've got to do. Well, that doesn't... That's not a that's not an efficient workflow process. That's not making sure that the factory, pardon the term, but the factory is is working to maximise the output that aligns to our financial outcomes. 
you need to make sure that the people who are working on your matters are doing the work on the matters in the order that is necessary, one, to ensure you know, that the, the matter is being addressed properly for the client, but two, it's also working in accordance with being done within the parameters of what's required by the business, when the business requires for it to be done, so it can also meet its financial obligations. You know, no, uh, no money comes in, everyone still gets paid. Um, you know, most people don't don't sort of pay too much attention to that. Timesheets, timesheets is critical. I'm going to go back over these in a moment, but timesheets is critical, and it's the focus on and the importance of timesheets as a discipline, and uh, and and making sure that timesheets are, are done on a daily pro basis, and also billing processes. So billing processes is the key because billing processes drive the the it is the ultimate driver of of what turns into your professional fees build, which is the measure of um, of your efficiency factor. No billings efficiency factor zero. Bill you've got at least got a number, but the timing of billing and how much is billed is really critical. So let me go through these in a little bit more detail. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the bottom up because we're going to start with billing. The first thing that you should do in your firm is remove the billing process discretion away from fee earners. It is critically important that fee earners do not have a say in the timing of when a matter is billed. There are three different types of matters, matter billing timing that you should be implementing in your business. And these are generally prescribed in, in, in cost agreements. I, I don't, I don't, can't think of a situation when, when they're not. The first one is if it's a deferred uh, billing matter, PI file, or maybe for for a reason you got a family law matter that there's a property and that's the only asset, and you've made the decision that you're going to carry the whip until the end of that that uh, and, and when that property gets sold and and cash is available. So that's a deferred matter that gets billed at the end. You know that that's a funding question. How much funding do we need to be able to pay all of our wages and all of our costs on the way through to be able to make sure we've got enough cash flow to do that work so that we get paid at the end? So that's the first one. So that's just going to happen. Second one is sta a stage-based bill or, or a fixed fee, you know, something that's going to happen at a point in time. So it might be that you've, you've got a matter that you've got various stages and when you've done that stage, it gets built. And that stage is, is often a specific thing. So probate's a good example. A lot of firms, when the probate's granted, they raise the fee. So so very different, though, from where you're then operating the trust administration and there's a bunch of money sitting in there, then you're doing work every month. Then, you know, you raise a fee then. And that's the third. That's the third. That's the monthly fee. Most matters in firms where it's all do and charge land in a monthly billing. So you have the opportunity with your engagement right at the very front of the client to say, this is how we're going to be doing it. We're going to be billing you monthly for the work that we do. Too many firms worry about, well, we haven't done work or we haven't hit a milestone. Or Who cares? It doesn't matter. The, as long as your engagement says we're going to bill you every month, and you might say that's going to be for an amount over $500 of whip and and disbursements, depending on what, you're, you know, what, what the work is that you're doing, but you might set that as a target so that you can then create an automatic billing process. And that automatic billing process is that draft fees are created and billed at those certain events or those certain that certain timing. So it might be that uh, that you bill on in the third week of every month. You know, there's nothing to say you got to bill on the last day of the month, but let's just say you're going to bill on the third week of every month. You might have four different fee earners in your firm and you bill each person bills at a different time, still billing out monthly but it's just at a different time during the month. But when you've got when you've got a when you've got a, a matter marked at that billing cycle, then those draft fees should just automatically get raised based on the width that's in there, and you have an approval process. But that happens at the finance level. That's finance admin, not waiting for the fee earner to say, "Oh, here's here's a list, tick it off." You know, none of that. Could take the the discretion away from them around determining when something gets billed. It gets billed at the time when the business needs it to be billed, not when they think the client might like it. Refer back to your cost agreement. Timesheets is the next one. So historically, people, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, historically everyone refer, gets people to focus on the amount that they've got to bill. That's not the driver 
of revenue. The driver of revenue is, is people hitting their five and a half hours or five hours or six hours, whatever that number is a day. So you need to make sure that that the, the understanding of what a timesheet is all about is about being able to capture and uh, the the uh, the data for every day of the, of the time that is being spent working on that client. Whether we build it or not, billing is a different timing. That's down the track. That's not at the time when you do that job. So yeah, you can say it's mandatory that you know record all your time. Challenging for people to do that. So here's a little tip around that. Go into firms and I say, what's not billable? Mm -hmm. Or in my terms, what's what what isn't a charged hour? And mm -hmm. what's not chargeable? What's not billable? There's always different answers. Uh, well, we do research, or we take a file note. When someone says, "No, that's billable," no, it's not, and the whole big list. So what we're we're doing again is we're leaving up to people's discretion to decide what they put into their timesheets or not. Another question that I always ask is, "Everybody busy?" And in the main, that is always yes. There's plenty of work. The thing is, you're not getting the revenue and profits out of the work that you are actually doing, and that's the key here. That's what we're trying to get to: get the get the revenue out of the work that you're doing. So the first thing you need to do is change a system. So remember, what can you control? Do something different and focus on the majority. The majority of people will do what you ask them in your business. And as long as they're clear on their expectations and clear on what the processes are, they will comply. We live in a conformist world. We, 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 most people survive because of structure. So think about it from a timesheets point of view. Don't say to people, you put all of this stuff down into WIP. Tell them what they don't put into WIP and everything else goes in there. You don't put into WIP. Doing a cost agreement, raising a fee, answering a fee inquiry. Everything else is the work we do. And separate the billing context from the time contract. Everyone's going to put it in. We need to know the numbers so we can determine things like pricing and, and you know cost allocation, um, all of this sort of stuff. But but you've got to change up the context and educate your team to what timesheets are about. They're used as a guide to billing, but we need to know all the work that's being done. So change that around. Workflow management, run a weekly workflow meeting with your team. So if you've got departments in your business, every, every team or every department should have a workflow meeting where the people come prepared, each fee owner comes prepared with the work that they've got to get done for that week. Get the work done. This is what we're going to do. And that's got to all be focused on if I've got five hours a day, I've got 25 hours worth of work to do. Where am I scheduling that into my calendar? Client engagement. Provide a covering letter with your cost agreement. And that says, this is the work that we're doing. This is what our estimate is. This is when we're going to bill you. And this is how you're going to pay. Mind you, put this X dollars amount in trust as well. It helps with the process of, of collections and driving your lockup percentage down. But engage your clients so that they know the rules. And then make sure your systems in your business comply with those rules. You don't go and buy a new car and they say you've got to pay for it when you drive out of the showroom, and then when you're driving out of the showroom, they just say, oh, don't worry about it, we'll build you next week. No, you've got to pay for it. Every transaction you make, you pay for it. Your business is no different. And fee earner engagement, educate them around WIP, educate them around billing, educate them around workflow management, educate them around what they've got to do from the client engagement, but most of all, engage with them around what's expected of them not just in terms of those items, but also in terms of their daily billable hours. Do you have enough work? Yes, if you do, then you should be hitting your numbers. What's happening to stop you doing that? Here's our billing, here's our timesheet policy. All the stuff that you're doing, you should be just putting on your timesheet. So do that. Get some better practice management software that allows you to track your time better, um, that, that connects to Outlook, that connects to SharePoint, all these different things. So. They're just some really quick, handy tips of what you can do to improve your average rate. Okay, so so in summary, that's uh, average rate is very much around focusing at the timesheet entry, improving your productivity, and then focusing at your billing to, to make sure that write-offs don't happen. Another, sorry, one other little another little billing billing. Um, uh, discretion that you need to remove. Remove the discretion of the ability to write off time at the, at the point in time of billing. Have a write off champion that is responsible for saying no. Build a system that stops the write offs.
Okay, so what we're going to do now is that's that that's the uh, that's all sort of the details of the webinar for today. Usually, what I do is I say to people, if you'd like to um, if you'd like to catch up and talk about uh, anything in your business, particularly in this case, it would be around your average rate. Then please email me and we will um, we'll organise a time. I'm going to do things a little bit differently this time because I'd really like to for you all to to participate in a little action that uh, we're going to be able to collate your personal information that you put into this survey and send it back to you. We will not be publishing this anywhere um, um, apart from you just receiving a single email with your numbers compared against the average of all firms that, that, that participate in this today. And we're just doing it today. This is just out of the participants in this webinar. So, Christina, if I can get you to launch the uh, launch the survey, there's only a few little questions that I'll get you to ask, uh, to answer. And then if you just take your time and work through each of those questions as, as we run through them, then, um, then we'll be able to uh, accumulate that data and we'll get those emails out to you. That's okay. awesome. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So just um, for those that may be new to this webinar, just a little bit of guidance here. Uh, so if you have joined using Microsoft Teams, you should sit in the middle of your screen. Um, if you've come through a web browser, the poll will be available in the meeting chat for you. So to kick off, uh, the first question is, uh, our best estimate of our average rate is, uh, the first one is, I have no idea, 90% oh, Sorry, plus. Christina, that should that should say our best estimate of our efficiency factor. Sorry, guys. I beg your pardon? So, uh, our, so our best estimate of our efficiency factor. So that's our ratio then of our, um, of our actual revenue to our capacity revenue. So if you've got no idea, um, just mark that one. 75% would be if your capacity revenue was uh, 600,000, but your but your professional fees billed is 450, then that's that's at 75%. So just just to to get you a bit of a gut feel. So if you can just answer that one, um, and then we'll move on to um, to the next to the one. The second one, absolutely. Okay, so the next question. So yep. this one is um, a scale mat. So all fee earners, including legal support, understand their budget. So number one is from a scale to one to five, one is disagree, five is agree. So again, with this one, you just think about, well, you know, how engaged are my team around what's expected of them? You know, do we have an annual budget? Do we, do we, do we review, um, do we review and provide them with information each week or each month around how they're going actual versus budget and their performance from both a whip entry perspective and a billing perspective and, and, and so on? Okay, so number three, Christine. Yeah, absolutely. This is also another uh, scale, one to five. All fee earners are provided with updates um, on their actual versus budget performance at least monthly. Yep. So every, every, uh, this is an extension of the previous question. So again, what we need to do is you got to make the invisible visible. What what you can measure, you can manage. So with our fee earners, if they're receiving their update, they can self monitor. And from my experience, the more people know where they're at in terms of what's expected of them, they 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 do self regulate and they do turn this around. Most firms don't provide any of this information to their to their fee earners, but they and then they wonder why nothing is changing. Okay, number four. Okay, the next one. We actively run weekly workflow meetings to drive priorities and work throughput. Again, a scale one to five. So you know, if you if you don't run any meetings at all ever, leave it up to everyone's discretion. Mark it as a one. If you've got those meetings and they're religiously being uh, run each week so that you're focusing priorities for everybody on what they need to be doing to advance clients files and finish matters to ensure that the the financial components of the business are met market as a five okay number five okay number five we have a formal process where our solicitors actively review and re-engage clients when whip approaches estimates again a scale one to five so in this in this case here, you know, um, you know, 
for example, as part of your workflow meetings, who are those clients that need to be re-engaged? Um, you know, whips at 80% or 85% of our estimate. You know, all practice management software allows us to put estimates in for matters so we can measure where the whip is up to it. And then how do we re-engage? That's what it says in our cost agreement. So how strong are you at that? You've got formal processes that make sure that happens. And the last one? Great. The last one is uh, timing of billing and billing processes are the responsibility of the finance admin team. Again, scale one to five. So what I'm talking about there is is not that fees get sent out by the admin part, uh, the admin team, the finance team. It's about taking responsibility for the timing of when those must get issued so that there's a draft fee that's created at this point in time that aligns to the, the billing systems of the business, that then, yeah, sure, you'll have an approval process of it, but you actually have that responsibility of making sure those fees are prepared and driven and the timing of when a fee is issued is no longer at the discretion of the fee earner, it's it's run by the ad finance admin team. So guys, look, just uh, if uh, if you've finished all of those questions, fantastic. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll be in touch and uh, flick you through just a summary, uh, which will show you a little bit of a graph as to how you compare to uh, the averages um, of everybody attending. Um, no no charge, no obligation, just information only. If there's anything you'd like to talk about in relation to those, please make sure that you reach out. As I said, next uh, webinar is going to be focusing on the cash flow side of that, taking our average rate um, strategies and then focusing on what we've then got to do to improve our cash flow in the business. So it's fine if we're going to be billing more, it's fine if we're going to improve profit, but we've got to get that money into the bank faster. And that's what we're going to be talking about next time. So thanks for attending and uh, we'll talk soon.